Welcome everyone to tonight's lecture on cybersecurity for the small business and everyone. Um, Liz Buckley is going to tell us quite a bit about cybersecurity. She's going to remove some of the confusion in the space and hopefully give us a few, some guidance on some basic steps that we can take to secure our information and our networks. Liz has spent the past 20 years working in a space that we commonly call the cloud. Uh, she's worked on mobile networks, cloud networks, cloud storage, and she's currently the uh, product security, vulnerability, and remediation program lead at Dell Technologies. And she hold, Liz holds a master's in cybersecurity from MTU. Liz, over to you. Thank you, Podrick. So good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this evening, especially on a Pancake Tuesday. So this evening, as Podrick said, um, we're going to look at some common cybersecurity threats and a few basic measures that anyone can do today to help protect them from their network and from these threats. And hopefully in doing so, we remove some of the confusion around the subject. So just as Padraig mentioned, who am I? Uh, my name is Liz Buckley. I have an MSc in cybersecurity from MTU in Cork. Um, and as Padraig said, I, I've spent a lot of time working in telecoms, cloud storage, and now working in the cybersecurity organization within Dell Technologies. So what do we think of when we think of hackers? Well, I know I have this image of a guy or a girl down in a kind of a dungeon type basement with loads of high tech equipment and screens with loads of text scrolling and, you know, bells and whistles going off. But the reality is they're more likely to look like this. It's the boy or girl next door. They've been over in your house. They have have your Wi-Fi password. You know, they mightn't be up to anything mischievous, but, you know, they just want to have a look around. They've done the Coder Dojo class and they're, you know, they're curious as kids are and not just the kids. It could be, you know, the foreign student you have over um, who has invited all their friends up to the bedroom to have a, you know, just a bit of crack, you know, checking out the network. And even without any malicious intent whatsoever, they could have something on their device that would spread onto your network and therefore onto your device. So with no measures in place, hacking is really easy. But with some measures and just small measures, you know, uh, maybe just enough to, to uh, deter an attacker. So what does the security landscape look like to the normal person? Well, there's an awful lot of buzzwords. There's an awful lot of information out there. And it's quite frankly, it's very overwhelming. And, you know, people get smothered in these words and they say, oh, God, you know, where, oh, how, what applies to me and where do I start? So the bottom line is, even if you only have a laptop at home and maybe you've got your TV connected via the Internet, if you're connected to the Internet at all, even with your phone, with your smartphone, these measures apply to you. So we're going to keep it quite simple and I often, you know, uh, liken this to securing your house. So the first steps, lock all entry points, protect your most precious assets and be vigilant. And some advanced steps we'll look at, like monitoring your network, that would be equivalent to say, setting up a CCTV camera around your house, detecting possible attacks to the same means and automating operating system updates. And creating policies. This is very important where, you know, you could have fun at home doing it with your family, but it's very important for offices who have a couple of employees in, in, in there that everybody is on the same page and is clear on what they must do. So the first thing we will we'll step, we'll talk about our passwords. Now, I'm sure many of you are sick and tired of hearing, oh, you must change your password every three months, but it actually really is important. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, default passwords like admin and password, um, and there are, are numerous ones out there, are all too easy to guess. And there are these programs called brute force programs, which generate a heap of these, these passwords very easily. 
and they, they run really quickly through, through the different variations and can get access to your system extremely fast. So what I do recommend is that you create a strong password. And by that, I mean the minimum of 12 letters with a small letter, a large letter, a special character, and a number. Do not, and please do not, store passwords in a text file on your desktop. Please do not write them down on post-its and do not share them over WhatsApp, text, or emails. Now you might say, how am I going to do this and how am I going to remember them? Well, it's very important to create a system that means something to you. So no, don't use your dog's name. Don't use your birthday because people have this information out there. So, you know, some kind of tips and tricks here, you know, you can use a, a phrase like the brown cow jumped over the moon to be with the dog. So for instance, you could take the first letter of each word. You could take the last letter from each word. You take, could take the second letter from each word. And um, you can mix up names of things around the house. Or you could get creative and develop your own code. You could actually have a lot of fun with that. Um, and for instance, the What Three Words app, for those of you who, who don't know what that is, basically What Three Words uh, identifies location. You put in a location and it gives you three words to identify it. So if you have a place in mind that means something to you, it could be a park, it could be a street, um, but something that you know you remember, but nobody else knows about. You could get those three words and use them in some variation for a password. That's, that's just some ideas. So the second thing is to know your devices. And really, either whether it's at home or in the office, the most important device you have is that box that connects you to the internet called, but well, we refer to it as the router. Now, the router box that you get is generally a combined router and a, what they call a wireless access point or your Wi-Fi access point. And the next set of devices would be like your 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 the ones that are really important, like your work devices, your laptops, your fax machines, your printers, your phones, and then your home devices. So again, it may be a variation of home laptops, phones, tablets, and the TV. Now, what's becoming very much into vogue are these smart devices or IoT devices. And these are the um, switches on your, on your wash machine, on your fridge. They could be on your security cameras, heating switches, for example, anything you can access over the internet that you switch on. Um, these devices are, are brilliant, but they are quite vulnerable and they, they are being used by hackers as an, a way in to people's networks. So the next set of devices then, of course, are your guests. The beauty of knowing what devices are on your network is if you are monitoring your network and you can use you can do this by using a simple app called Fing. It's, it's a free app um, and you can actually spot what devices are currently on your network. And if you see something that shouldn't be there, you know somebody's on there that shouldn't be. So you can kick them off. And we'll talk now a bit about routers and the, the wireless access point or the Wi-Fi connection. So these are quite vulnerable and let's face it, most people now use Wi-Fi to connect to the internet. So it's important to know where your wireless access point is and do you know who you share it with? And the reason I bring this up is an awful lot of offices share a building. And you may not realize it, but you could be sharing the Wi-Fi point with all those offices. So everybody in the building is connected to the one network. And if that is the case, all the devices can see each other and they can see your devices. Now that's okay, but you could have somebody in the car park who's had a bad meeting, doesn't like the guy who he went in to see, and is, you know, accessing the network from the car park, from his car, but he can also see your device. So you can't be too careful. So my advice to you would be, please get your own router. You can plug it into the in internet connection, to, uh, to the network connection in the building, um, and set up your own wireless access point and you can actually hide that wireless access point. It's called an SSID when it pops up on your computer and you can just hide it. And the next step we'll talk about is protecting your most precious assets, segregation. So the one thing I will say is please create a guest network. 
And you can do this at home and you can definitely do it in your office router. Um, so most routers nowadays definitely have the ability to create a guest network. And you can do this through the, uh, the GUI interface or, or the, basically the interface on, that they give you um, from the, your ISP provider. If you have a router that allows you to do so, you should segregate your smart devices or your I IoT devices next, and then your work and home devices. And I'll go into this a, bit, a little bit more. This is just an example of an attack that happened. And the reason why it was so detrimental was because all the devices were on what we call a flat network. Um, and that's where none of, oh, none of, it was just one single network. Uh, there was no segregation deployed. So basically what happened was, this is Target. It actually happened in 2014. And those who don't know, Target is actually our departmental store in, in the States. And the hacker was able to get in through the air conditioning units. And um, when they got in there, they were able to access the tills. And then they were able to get 70 million customers' credit card details. And needless to say, it actually cost Target $300 million in data breach lawsuits. So that's just an example um, and the beauty of segregation. And you might say, what does that mean to me? Well, for example, this is a proof of concept network I put together for my, my masters. And I put every device I had onto it. So I put my Google Nest, I put my printer on, I put all kinds of devices, Raspberry Pis, everything I could find, lap, uh, iPads, you name it. I also put my work laptop on there and I put an old laptop. And this beauty runs a very old operating system, Windows Vista. And then I ran a scan on the network to see how vulnerable were my devices. So. Basically, when it comes to this, your, your network is going to be as secure as your, as your weakest link. Um, and when I ran the scan, these were the results. So the blue indicate low, uh, low severity vulnerabilities. And these are the numbers here on, on the left-hand side. And these are the devices down along, along the bottom. The red indicate the high and critical actually, sorry, the critical vulnerabilities and the yellow are the high ones and the blue, the low. So you can see here that my home laptop, my Veo running Windows Vista is extremely vulnerable, too critical, too high and one low. My printer is also looking a little bit dodgy. And this is important because in both these cases, my, the, the software on them is too old and they're extremely vulnerable. So it's important to keep your printer software or what they refer to as firmware up to date, as well as all your laptops. And in fact, all your devices should have the latest software on them simply because they have the latest security fixes in there. And this is my network after I segregated it. So as you can see here, I've got a guest network. So anybody can log on here. You can and safely because they can't access any of the other networks. I've got my work devices safely hidden away here. I've got my smart devices over here, so they can't access any of the other devices, and my home devices. So you might ask, how do I segregate? So you can use, if you, if you prefer to use a wired network, there's the thing called virtual local area networks, uh, or VLANs for short. And you can, you can actually subdivide your network into different VLANs. Um, otherwise, you can set up different wireless access points or you know, the Wi-Fi, basically wire, the Wi-Fi access point. Um, and depending on your router, it, it, you know, you'll know once you log into your router what you're actually able to do. But at the very minimum, create that guest network. So the next step then is to apply the principle of least privilege. And you might say, what on earth is she on about? What does she mean by that? So basically it's assigning folders and files uh, to people on a need to know basis. Um, so we know how to secure a network. We know how to secure our devices. 
So folders and files, you can password protect your folders and you can password protect your files. So say in an office you have HR information or on finance information. Well, only the HR people should be able to see your HR information. And only the finance people need to see the finance information. So give them specific passwords each for their folders, especially if you're you know, sharing a server within an office. And you can apply the same to, to files. So I've put in links here for each of the operation systems to help you have a look at that and see if you want to set that up. So the next step, and this is very important, especially with uh, recent events, protecting your client data by applying encryption. And the reason this is important, you want to develop a, you know, trust with your customers and it is a service that they now look for. And it's not just for them, it's for you as well. So you do have a responsibility because of GDPR, um, you have a responsibility for looking after client data and not disclosing it. But you also need to protect yourself. You need to protect yourself from ransomware, litigation, and bad press. So, okay, you might ask, how, how will this protect me from ransomware? Well, if your files are encrypted, they are completely useless to a hacker. Um, it's, and again, if they have files that are encrypted, they can't sell them. They can't disclose them because it's all gobbledygook to them. So you're keeping that data safe and you're saving yourself from any bad press or litigation. The opposite is also true if you get caught with ransomware, but as I say, if you take the measures here, you should be safe. Stefan Napo um, made this statement and it's very true. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and a few minutes of a cyber incident to ruin it. So some encryption tools. Um, OpenSSL is a free tool and it's available on all operating systems as well. Um, now I have put in some, a link to some other encryption tools that are you can pay for, um, but the main thing when we're using an encryption tool is to have a good key, same as the passwords, have a good strong key and put that key somewhere safe. And the next step, taking backups and not just taking regular backups, but securing your backups. Now, a lot of people uh, use cloud offerings like Dropbox and Google, and, and they're great, but I'm very old fashioned myself, and I would recommend that you keep a backup on a hard drive separate, separate from your network, in fact, even if it's just a hard drive. And, in order, and then that will allow you to isolate that backup device and keep it safely off the network and on, away from intruders. And the reason I say this is ransomware hackers are getting very cute and now they're targeting backup servers. So if you have a backup server that is on the internet and you have to keep it there, I would advise you to run malware and virus detection on a regular basis. Automating backups. Now this will take the pain away from having to remember to take your backups. And again, I've put in links here um, for every operating system that should help you to do that as well. And this one, and I'd say a lot of you have heard this time and time again as well, you know, keep your software and firmware up to date, but it is extremely relevant today because the latest software you have now um, have the latest security fixes in it. And this is very true of, of the following um, two viruses that we've, we've had, like Log4j was just before Christmas and the most recent, the only the up-to-date software that's been released now since even like December, January, will have a fix for that. And what Lock4j was actually is basically it's a piece of code that's run by web servers for logging events. But it's quite a clever piece of code because it allows you to actually run code within that logging system. But it actually allowed hackers to run their code as well. So basically it's been fixed. The fix is out there, so make sure you keep those updates, those patches, sorry, and uh, software up to date. The WannaCry virus, and I mentioned that here because many of you may have heard of this back in 2017. And 
what happened here is it actually infiltrated a lot of institutions, including the NHS in the UK. Uh, and again, it spread a ransomware virus. Um, and the pity of it was, was Windows had actually released a fix for this to remediate against this, this WannaCry virus two months before the WannaCry virus took over uh, a lot of the institutions. So if everybody had kept their operating system up to date, they wouldn't have been impacted by this. So malware and virus detection. So again, malware and virus detection software, they're only, they only can detect the malware uh, and viruses that are already known out there. So they also need to be kept up to date because they'll have the most recent database of those, of those uh, malware and viruses. It's definitely worth investing in a good one, but there are free ones out there, like Avast is one free one. But I would, if you can, if your budget allows for it, to invest in a good one, like Trend Micro, McAfee, Norton. Um, and please, if they report an alarm and say, you know, we suspect this is a dodgy piece of code or something on your system, please take he heed of what the report says. Because like the HSE, they actually were alerted, but they didn't pay any attention to those alerts. A monitor and detection. Okay, so you can go quite simply with monitoring your, your, your devices, like I said earlier, by using the Fing app. Um, and that will give you a list of your, the devices that are connected on your network. And even that might actually, you might actually catch somebody on your network who shouldn't be there. So even that level of monitoring is, is better than none. But you can also use Get Software um, to monitor your traffic. Because if you spot anything strange, like if you know your traffic is, say, a certain level and never really that high, there's never that much going on, and then suddenly there's a surge of traffic, you're probably getting what they call a denial of service attack. So again, you know you, you need to react and you need to take your devices off the network. Um, there's, as I said, there's many, there's a lot of software, good software tools out there, in fact, like uh, Trend Micro, SolarWinds, uh, the Unified Dream Machine. They're excellent tools for monitoring and detecting. You, know, you will have to pay for those and they will be configured. They can be configured to generate alarms. If you have a network, you know, in an office and you're, you're, you're planning to expand, I, I would say it's worth hiring somebody to, to actually monitor on a regular basis. Okay, so the next point, when you're roaming with your laptop, and if you really have to connect to somebody else's Wi-Fi, um, especially a public Wi-Fi, I would advise you to um, set yourself up with a virtual private network. And what this service actually provides is you form an agreement with the VPN server provider. Um, and basically you have a piece of software called a VPN client running on your laptop. When you connect, you connect via your VPN, you create a secure tunnel to the internet over here. So this is completely secure now. And what this will do for you is it will hide your IP address. It will hide and encrypt all the data you're sharing that's going through the VPN server to the internet. So if anybody else is on that Wi-Fi connection that you're connected to and is trying to spy on your device and trying to, you know, look at what packets you're sending out, they can't, because all they'll see is the VPN server IP and they can't connect to it. So the next point is to always be vigilant. And we'll go through these in the next few slides, the websites, emails, texts, WhatsApp, and phone calls. So websites, well, as I said, Try in all times, if you can, not to connect to uh, unknown Wi-Fi networks, especially public ones. Um, ensure that the guests on your network only join your guest network and not uh, any of your other networks, not your private network. Try not to visit unsecure websites. And here you'll see this is a secure website. And this icon appears on the top left corner of, of your web page. And if it's open, it means it's not secure. Never enter your information on, a, on an insecure web page. And I'd even be cautious about entering information on a secure web page. 
make sure it's one that, that's well known. Um, don't save your password or credit card info via Google. You know that lovely friendly pop-up that comes up on the, on the right-hand side? Ignore it, decline it. And please don't save credit card information on the websites when online shopping. Emails and texts. Always be very vigilant, especially with attachments uh, to emails, because this is actually how the HSE got caught. Um, very innocent person just downloaded an Excel spreadsheet and clicked on it, and it spread the virus. And that's a very common way for uh, ransomware, in fact, to spread. So if you don't recognize the sender's of address um, or the phone number, this goes for phone calls as well and texts, just ignore them or delete them. Um, if you know it's out of character or, you know, you know the sender, but, you know, they're not addressing you in the usual manner, it's probably wrong. Um, especially if there's any embedded hyperlinks or, like I say, attachments, just ignore them. If you do know the sender, phone them up and ask them if they've sent you an attachment. And then some other steps you can take is you can research the address um, or the hyperlink on Google and just check it out and see if it's actually genuine or not. Uh, you might get some hits there that actually tell you it's it's spam or it's dodgy. Um, yeah, never click on, on open attachments without, without ver verifying validity. And you know those text messages that come in, especially around Christmas time, you know, where, oh, you owe customs duty. Ignore them. If you're in doubt at all, go directly to the web page of the courier or, you know, if it's you think it's from the bank or whatever, phone the bank up. They will never, ever ask for information on text or emails. So the next step, and this is the role of policies. And again, the reason these are important is just to keep everybody on the same page. So if you have somebody new coming into your office um, and they're, they're not sure, you know, what, what the gist or the lie of the land is, you have your policies there around security at the very least so they know what they need to do. So you can have policies to say, look, just generate a secure password and this is how you do it. Apply the principle of least privilege and um, keep your operating system and firmware up to date, encrypt sensitive data, secure the key and take regular backups. And get everybody on board, use incentives, you know, if you have to, um, some kind of merit award every month or, or quarter or something like that, and just make security part of the office culture. If in the unfortunate event you do get attacked, knowing what to do, just be prepared, have an incident plan. So identify the device that you believe is being attacked or devices, isolate those and contain them and protect the rest of your network. Get help if needed. Don't be shy to reach out. There are many uh, very good, like Trend Micro is one that you can reach out to and ask for help. Uh, the Gardaí, in fact, are, are, you can also reach out to them and they'll put you in contact with people who can help. And then eradicate the problem. So this may mean that your laptop or whatever device it is may need to be wiped clean um, or maybe just a matter of just removing the malware on, on that device. But then you can recover from your backups because you've been taking them regularly. Make a report on what has happened just in case. And in that way, you can learn from the lessons and learned from what just happened. So a summary, just 13 quick steps. Know your devices, use a secure password, protect your most precious assets using segregation and apply the principle of least privilege. Protect your client data using encryption. Take regular backups and secure your backups and regularly update your device's software and firmware. Use malware and virus detection. If possible, use monitor and detection systems. And when roaming, use a VPN. Always be vigilant. Create policies and have an instant plan. And this is just sort of a visual summary of, you know, 
each of the uh, steps that we went through and what uh, threats they actually mitigate against. So some more fancy buzzwords for you. MITM is man in the middle and war driving. They're very similar. So this is where you have a device on your network that shouldn't be there because they're there to spy on your packets and on your traffic going around your network. So knowing what devices you have can mitigate against those. Brute force um, is mitigated by having a strong password. Phishing is mitigated by being vigilant. And data breach and ransomware is mitigated by having your files encrypted and taking regular backups and also segregating your data. Denial of service attacks are mitigated by traffic, by, sorry, by monitoring your traffic. And malware and viruses can be mitigated by keeping those scans going regularly and keeping your scanning software up to date. And again, data breach is, your, is mitigated by being able to respond quickly, removing those devices that are affected and isolating your, your sub networks. And ransomware, well, if you've got a backup and you have encrypted your files, the, the ransomware hacker, he's the loser here. And I've just put in some links for some resources that you might find, find useful and some of the references that I've used in the slide deck. So any questions? Many thanks, Liz. Um, there are a few questions um, in the Q&A section. And those of you who want to ask further questions, the Q&A section down on the bottom of your screen, not in the chat section, please. So. Um, John Smith, um, does using my VPN, work one on work laptop and free one on home laptop, protect me at all, or do I need segregation? The VPN, especially if it's like with your work laptop, say from, from whoever, you know, you work for, if they provided you with a VPN, your laptop is safe, but, um, your work laptop is safe, but you, there are other devices at home you might be using that you connect to like uh, your printer and that which you should segregate from, particularly your guests. Okay. We've had a comment or question from Winston, um, just about older routers, Linksys and Netgear that can never mm -hmm. be fixed by a firmware update. Do you want any comments on that, Liz? I'd replace them, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, they, they are great names and they were very good in their day, but I would actually replace them. Okay. Do you have any recommendations? And this isn't, you'll have to be diplomatic here, as regards hardware or software providers to avoid. Um, apparently, there's been a lot of talk in the news about some companies being linked to nefarious governments, linked right. to law in their countries. So, you have any, idea, any ideas or thoughts on that? It's not something I'm terribly familiar with, I'll be very honest. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Winston has been busy. He's on um, the padlock on the link on the web page. Yeah. Is it true that this says that the connection is secure to the web page as opposed yeah. to the website itself? OK. It's basically the TLS connection. There is a TLS connection created by the web server that's providing the web address. Um, so it's it's provided by whoever that application is providing that application basically. So it does mean you have a secure connection. Um, but again, you know, it's worth looking into what version they're running. It, you know, it, they should be running TLS version one point two at a minimum. Thank you. Is there a suitable VPN that you would recommend? Um, I hear that there are some VPNs that keep logs of your activity while connected. Are there VPNs that don't keep logs of your activity? I'm not sure where that person is going, but you might have a comment. Well, I, I understand because I suppose if a VPN is logging your activity, you might feel that that data can be breached in some way. But basically, you know, it's worth taking a look around and seeing what uh, offerings are out there. Again, go, go with reputable uh, companies, you know, when it comes to a VPN provider, um, they have to have, again, agreements in place to keep your data secure. So um, again, just, just go with the reputable ones. Okay. Um, 
I have one question here. It's a strange one. Hello, do you think using antivirus softwares are safe to use? I'm guessing the answer to that, Liz, is that yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I, I, if you're if if they're asking about free versions, again, Avast is actually a well-known free one, and and they are quite good. Again, keep them up to date. Uh, get the latest version. Um, now, if if you want and you can afford to to pay for one, it, it's probably worth doing. Like again. I know like the trend micros of the world and it, because they're based in Cork as well, uh, are very <laughs> reputable. <laughs> there's Norton and, and then there, there's the usual ones, but I, you know, they're, they're kind of a company you can ring up and, and ask for help as well. So I don't work for them, but <laughs> I am plugging them because I know they're good. We have two inquiries about the uh, presentation and the links contained within just for all attendees the lecture is being recorded it will be shared up on the youtube engineers ireland youtube channel in the coming days liz has prepared a printer friendly pdf of the presentation i.e not with all the black background and chewing up your toner and uh, and ink and that will be sent out to all people who registered for tonight's event there's a question here about whatsapp are there specific risks when WhatsApp is used for business? I'd, I'd be very careful using WhatsApp. I know they say the, the uh, channel is secure, but I would not be sharing anything, any any critical information, personal information, passwords, or anything like that over WhatsApp. Okay. Um, question about Fang, which I presume is... Um, Fing on your main Fing. computer. Should you download Fing on your main computer? Um, you don't really need to. Uh, and the reason I say that is, I, I've used Fing and I, I've messed around with it a bit. Now, the free part of it, which is just detecting your devices, is the best part. If you are looking for something to monitor your traffic, I would go elsewhere. Um, so you don't need to download it to your PC, your 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 um, tablet, or your phone. For the free part is, is enough with thing okay more requests for the slides we've addressed that one robert is uh thankful for the presentation um he was the victim of a ransomware attack about six years ago attacked his external hard drive as well but luckily he had another external hard drive which had a backup that was a couple of months old so endorses some of the, your recommendations for sure Nothing like Great learning stuff. the hard way. Yeah. It's better if you can learn from someone else's hard way. Um, inquiry here, we have job mobiles and we use them regularly for emails and calendars, etc. Do you think using mobiles is safe or are there ways to protect them? Mobile phones, you have to think about them in the same way as your laptop. They, they are many computers, um, you know, the smartphones nowadays. So I would apply the same vigilance and, uh, you know, malware virus detection on your phone as you would your laptop. Okay. Um, okay, more questions about phones, that's fine. Any issues about games or someone taking your data on phones? Again, you keep your games on a separate network to your, you know, what I call your precious assets and um, work devices and anything that has important sensitive information could should always be kept separate from anything like gaming. Um, anonymous attendee, could you explain encryption of data? Would it take a lot of resources to use it for databases within a company? Database encryption now is different from encrypting files and folders. So, you know, a bit of research needs to go into that. Um, a lot of databases uh, should have a, a means to encrypt the data within themselves, but um, it's not an area I'm terribly familiar with. Okay. Um, again, a couple of compliments on the presentation, Liz. Um, Thank you. Excellent presentation, uh, very practical advice. Um, so, and I suppose I, at this stage, I would echo those sentiments, Liz, and I'd like to express the appreciation of STEM Southwest and the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland, and indeed the Mechanical and Manufacturing Division of Engineers Ireland. Thank you very much for the effort that you put into this. 
very practical and informative uh, presentation. My pleasure. Um, Thank you for having me. <laughs> great. Um, 